Good evening and welcome to Face to Face, the show where we talk with local broadcasters here in South Dakota. Today on my show, we have a team that's been together for quite a while. They were a team during their morning show at Good Morning Dakota, then one left, but then they came back together. <laughs> and now they do Dakota First News <coughs> 6 and 10 on KSFY. I'm with Mitch Krebs and Nancy Nade today. Thank you both for being here. You bet, Abby. Thanks for having us. How long have you two really, how long have you been a team? Well, he divorced me. You were right about that. He totally <laughs> left me abandoned. Uh, but how long? Five years ago. Yeah. Five years ago in January, I came up and started on, it was Eyewitness News this morning back then, and uh, Nancy had been doing that for a few years already, so I was kind of the new guy. And then, pff, gone. Gone to the big time. <laughs> but he couldn't get away from me too What did we get, two years then? Yeah. On the morning show together? Wow. Been weird. Almost two years apart, and now mm -hmm. we're back together. We've been together again for a year. Where did you guys get your um, interest in broadcasting? Did you get it when you were in high school or even before then? High school for me. Yeah, we actually had a, a, a program a lot like this where we actually got to learn, you know, broadcast journalism in high school. A lot of <laughs> high schools aren't fortunate enough to have something like this, so mm -hmm. that's kind of what got me going early on. <clears throat> me too. We had a program in high school, and I decided right then I was, I was going to do this. I've known probably since I was a sophomore, junior in high school that I want to do this. Plus, I like to ask a lot of questions. I'm kind of snoopy that way. What, uh, what were your influences in uh, television? Did you well, have like any role models that you looked up to? Well, f really I was involved in the drama program and that got me kind of the taste of it. I knew I wouldn't be able to go off to Hollywood and be an actress because the, real the reality of that just doesn't happen very often. Um, you know, I used to always watch Oprah and I liked how she interviewed. I don't watch as much as her, uh, of her anymore. I really like Peter Jennings. I think he's one of the best at what he does. Watching election coverage this year, watching the New Year's Eve, you know, 2000, just how he talks, and he's so smart. And Mitch Krebs. <laughs> <coughs> you shouldn't lie on TV. <laughs> I'm not That's lying. That's a bad thing to do. <laughs> I started out uh, in sports, actually. Really? I wanted to, wanted to be a, a sportscaster. I was an athlete in high school and college and worked for the University of Minnesota basketball program uh, for three years and came out and actually started as weekend sports at a station out in Nebraska. So switching to news was a little bit different, but it seems like there's more substance with what you do with news. Um, sports is really unpredictable, and it's in, it's a, it's a it's a field that everybody wants to go into. Everybody wants to be on Sports Center, <laughs> so the competition for the jobs is a lot higher. And I think news is just more interesting. Mm -hmm. But well, he could do. I mean, he could jump in and do sports if he wanted him to. He knows players from 20 years ago that played on some team I've never heard of. He knows stuff. The education that you guys got in college, um, what was it? You know, what did you have to do? I was in communications, actually. At, at the time, I was originally going to go into uh, sports information. Really? And uh, which is, it puts together the, uh, works with the media and the teams. Uh, it's a team assistant. You write the, uh, the game programs and get the stats out at halftime, deal with, deal with people who are on the air and let them, you know, set up with interviews and things like that. And, uh... But you realize there are a bunch of egomaniacs and you wanted no part of that. In sports? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Because there's none of those in TV. No, no, not. <laughs> no. I took mass communications. I went to the University of South Dakota. I'm a proud yote. And uh, <laughs> I, I kind of got into this, too, because I didn't want to take a whole bunch of math. And, math. Yeah. That's why most people are in TV, you know, to avoid <laughs> We're math. We're no good in math. Just... What did you have to do in uh, college? We had a lot of broadcast. The first couple of years is your standard. You know, you take... Uh, the biology and, and all the basics, and then you really just take a lot what of What do you do for, mass, for the mass communication degree? We had all different kinds of broadcast journalism class. You were on the radio. We did a little PR. We did some marketing. I wanted to get kind of a vast array of, of you know, marketing and communication, so I took a little of everything, but you really do a lot of, of this. We had a show that we did every week, and that was a lot of work. You know, no one knew how to edit back then. We tried to voice our, our story and edit while we went, and it was just a nightmare. So you learn a lot. <laughs> what were your uh, first jobs out of college? Well, my first job was an internship. Okay. By not going through a broadcast journalism program, I learned most of what I know about this business through my first job as an internship out in Scotts Bluff, Nebraska. It was a little tiny station. Uh, everybody said it's not the end of the world, but you can see it from there. <laughs> and it was uh, Market 195 out of what 230 markets in the in the country, so a pretty oh, really small, small station where you do everything. And I started out interning there and learned the business hands-on from uh, a great guy, news director by uh, a guy named Dennis Lortz out there, taught me almost everything I know about this business. And it was like taking an extra you know year of college 
to learn all that stuff that you know you, you don't get taught in school. The practical experience is, is really what, what I think helped me a lot. Mm -hmm. I learned a lot on my internship too. I did that after I graduated. I did it at KTIV and I was like a reporter except I didn't really know too much mm -hmm. but I learned a whole lot. It was a school of hard knocks. You know you didn't get paid for it and it was the hardest three months of my life and I learned mm -hmm. the most in that time. We'd have to do stories and of course the intern always got the crummiest camera. It had the straight <laughs> bar metal so me carrying that is like I have indent still on my shoulder to this day, and that was back in 90. And then I, wow. I went to a much bigger station than Mitch started out at. I went to Mankato, Minnesota, which was just a step down probably <laughs> from Scott's Bluff. But again, you, you go to small stations, and you learn a lot. You do a lot. You're the reporter, the uh, camera person. You edit it. You write it. You do everything and I, you learn so much. It's funny, Nancy and I have been in the business about the same amount of time total, and people that started back you know, in, in the late 80s and early 90s all have war stories about internships because that's how you learned. You mm -hmm. carried these big cameras, you didn't get paid to do it because there were so many people looking for jobs in TV. One year there were 11,000 people graduated nationwide with broadcast journalism degrees and only 3,000 of them found jobs. So you go where the wow. job is to get mm -hmm. the experience and to move up to a bigger market. See, he knows stuff. <laughs> you do. <laughs> when did you guys first uh, individually come to KSFY? I came in 92. I came what? in uh, June of 92. Did you come from uh, KTIV? Or? No, I came from Mankato, KEYC. Oh. I'd been there for a year and a half. And uh, our chief photojournalist, Lonnie Nichols, and I, we graduated together from USD, and he was here. And I had talked to him on the phone, and then I ran into him in Sioux Falls. I was here with some friends, and he said, Nancy, you really should go go talk to the news director, they're hiring. So the next day I popped in, hello, you want to hire me? <laughs> they didn't at first, after a month and they did. <laughs> I kept pestering them. And the rest is history. Yes, <laughs> they're regretting it still. <laughs> uh, Mitch, when did uh, I came in here in January of 96 uh, from Scott's Bluff. I worked my way up from uh, intern to news director down there. I was there for four and a half years and uh, found out about a job from a friend who, was, who I worked with in Nebraska. Uh, Scott Cavanaugh was at KSFY and kept telling me about job openings down. You know, he would call me down in Nebraska and say, come on up here, it's a great station to work at, it's a great town to live in. And uh, I ap applied for a reporter job and that was filled by somebody else. And then all of a sudden the news director called me and said, I've got something, something better. It's a, it's a morning anchor. I thought, well, great, morning anchor is better than you know, General Simon, a reporter. So <laughs> yep. it worked out really well. And, and Mitch loves to get up early. Yeah, 2.30 <laughs> alarm going off. But That's really not even morning. As a news director, what did you have to do? In, in that size of a market, it's everything. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, well, the, you're a reporter, a photographer, a writer, a producer, um, a manager. You hire and fire. You do budgets. and, and, and Chief babysitter Sounds because like the people that you're that you're hiring at a market that small are, are right out of college that, that don't know the business and you you have to sit and do a lot of hand holding and bring them along and say this is the way we do things here and just ten different hats. So but great experience. Did you have to get the anchors coffee or did they get you coffee? I got my <laughs> since I was both I got myself coffee. <laughs> When you two did the uh, morning show together, how was that different from regular news, you know, from 6 and 10 or, or any other evening newscast? You got to goof around a lot more. Yeah. You because know, it's morning news. People are waking up, they're tired, they're cranky. We know that because we had gotten up four hours earlier. What time do you two have to, when you did the morning show, what time did you have to wake up? Between 2 and 2.30. Because mm -hmm. we, we would come in and... It's, it's, it's a regular news show in that you want to give people the basic facts of what's going on. Anything that happened overnight in the community, people, you know, we're always told, let people know that their world didn't change overnight and we want you to be the first faces they see in the morning. You've got to be chipper, you've got to be happy, otherwise people are going to go, I'm grumpy, I'm crabby, why do I want to watch these people who are the same way? And like Nancy said, you get, you get more leeway to have fun because it's, you know, with an hour or an hour and a half show, which it became later, um, you've got more time to get that stuff in. You can be yourself a lot more. It's a lot more ad-libbing. You're not sticking straight to the hard news of the day because you've got more time to get everything in. And at night, I mean, we still can have some fun, but it's usually at the end of the show when we leave people with a, a happy, lighthearted, kind of goofy mm -hmm. story. But otherwise, we're not going to joke around because the news is much s more serious at 6, and we don't want people to think that we take it lightly. So it's been a... It's been a harder transition for me just because I was on the morning show for so long and we mm -hmm. got, you know, got used to cackling and laughing and, and making fun and doing some cooking. Yeah, I kind of did both because in, in Nebraska I did the, uh, the, we had a 5.30 and a 10 o'clock show that I did both and we're just straight news shows and then came and got you know, loosened up and did that show <laughs> so now I've got the best of both worlds. Yeah. 
What's something that uh, people would find surprising about uh, you two as anchors that they don't really uh, know or even think about? Well, I, I want to answer for Mitch. He has got the quickest wit. I mean, like that. I mean, he really could perform on a stage at the Funny Bone or, or any other comedy club, and I think he really harnesses that, and he kind of keeps that in because he is, you know, a very legitimate newsman, and uh, I don't think people always get to see that side of him because, you know, he does do the news so well and knows so many things about everything. He knows, and he's also watched every single Seinfeld, Seinfeld episode, <laughs> and he can tell you anything about that. But he really, he's got the quickest wit, and is. Uh, He's funny. I think people know he's funny, but they just don't know how he could just go all the time. See, the, the one secret about Nancy that people know <laughs> now that didn't know before when she was on the morning show is that she is a very serious journalist. That she, because uh, people got the image that she's always having fun and smiling and stuff like that. That she, she knows as much about uh, news and, and what's hard news and what's important to people. Than, than anybody and people are know that now since she's mm -hmm. been on the evening news for for a year and the other thing is that she's a great singer no she won't admit it no she will i not am admit not it, but she's a great not. singer we had to do a fundraiser uh for the community playhouse last year and she came out and did a, a sunny and share routine and you would have thought she was Cher. You, you really wouldn't, because no, I had a really ugly wig and i'm much heavier than Cher and i can't <laughs> sing she's a good singer and you know it he was in the gear daddies from minneapolis minnesota I, people are starting to know that now. So, now so people are telling me that. Did you know Mitch Krebs is in the Gear yeah. Daddy's? Like, yeah, I sure did. So <laughs> your earlier like like theater days helped you out. It's all performing. Yeah. You know, that's you'll you'll find that most people that, that work on on broadcast TV, the do or excuse me, the do news, um, were either singers, actors, musicians, stuff like that, because it's mm -hmm. it, it is performing. And when you first do this, you know this, Avi, from when the first time you roll the tape and you go on and you know you get that <laughs> adrenaline rush and you're and you're trying to be on and do everything the right way. It's kind of the same thing. I mean, it's not you know when I used to play in in the band, it's, you come out and there's you know a couple thousand screaming people and you're you know playing screaming rock chicks. and roll. And fun, <laughs> you know, and it's not the same thing, but it's it's kind of the same you know the same rush that you get for you know it's it's entertainment. You know, people that say that that news isn't entertainment are wrong because if it's not, people wouldn't watch. You we just don't do hello, how are you? <laughs> we just don't do any of that. Maybe you should do more of that. <laughs> that kind of hurts, so I'm not going to do. Did that. your theater years help you out when? Because theater is live, and so is you know the nightly news, six and ten. You guys mm -hmm. are always on live. Did that help you out there too, as well? Absolutely. You can't really do a whole lot of do-overs when you're on the stage. Wait, I said the wrong line. You just kind of have to go with the flow. Some nights it's easier than others, definitely. To me, it, doing news is easier because you sit here, and, and people always say, you know, you put a camera in their face, oh, I don't want to be on TV. But, you know, you sit here, there's, there's the camera's there, it's glass and metal. Looking out into a room of a couple hundred people and doing a yeah. speech or something like that terrifies me. That, me that's, too. That's, that's the part of it I don't like a whole I would, lot. Yeah, I would rather do this than have a room filled with people and have them staring at you. It makes me very uncomfortable. Because then reaction to what you're yeah. saying, and sometimes it's not good. What, I'm not funny? <laughs> What's a... I want to say a normal day, but what is like a, a sort of a regular day at the station like? <laughs> well, a regular day, I mean, we have, we have certain tasks that we have to do every day. You come in, the first thing you want to do is, well, you want to read the newspaper when you get up in the morning, just to get yourself okay. familiarized mm -hmm. with what's going on. Some of the things that may be going on that we didn't cover the night before, or to see who got what. That, I mean, that's a big thing, competition for who gets what stories. Uh, we come in and read The Wire and work with the producer to decide what's going to be in the show and uh, rewrite things and just go through the day and Nancy and I will both write a lot of our own stuff or rewrite what other people have written just so it's more the way we would say it so we can come across more naturally. Yeah, a lot of people don't talk like I do so it's I have to change stuff because I'm goofy that way but we always check the board when we come in to see if we're down for a story and um, and then we go out and do that, or if somebody has shot something in the morning, then we'll have to gather information and write that. And We write teases for two different radio stations that we're on, and we write a little email tease that goes out to our subscribers that says, watch KSFY tonight at 6, this is what you're going to see. One thing people might not know either is that we'll be out covering a story and somebody will say, well, it's nice they let you get out and report news every once in a while. We're reporters and anchors both at our station. That's important for our philosophy at Dakota First News is that we're not just sitting there. We don't show up at the station 15 minutes before a newscast and sit down and read what other people have written. You know, we go out and cover things ourselves and, and it's important because if you don't, you don't come across as being credible and people aren't going to believe what you're saying. And we wouldn't know what was going on. I mean, and we go out and do a lot of um, not necessarily just PR, but we go to a lot of different events. People ask us to MC this or, you know, host this or go see kids, and that's we, we love doing that. And then we know what's going on in the community too. You have to be a part of the community because you know, 
I, I live in Sioux Falls, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm proud to be in Sioux Falls, and I love our community here, Me too. and I want to make sure things are going well and be part of it, not just be an observer. Right. We love this city. Most of these questions now are just general opinion ones. What, what's been one of the most interesting stories you two have done separately? I think the most, uh, boy, every story I think that we do is interesting. We learn something about someone else, and that to me is very interesting. Uh, Mitch did a great piece last night on one of our friends, Donovan Decker, who has muscular dystrophy. He went out to Washington and is trying to get federal funding to fight this horrible disease. And he, just why, I know him, and Mitch did the piece, and it was just, it was very hard for me not to cry last night on the news. But one of the best pieces I think I've ever done <clears throat> was on a little girl named Colette Foster, who was a Make-A-Wish child. She was dying. And I did this story, and it, it was a special story, and it wasn't going to air for two weeks. After we taped the interview, a week, a week later, she died, and I had to put that together. And it was the hardest thing I've ever done. Mm -hmm. But it just, she was just such a precious girl, and her family was wonderful. And th I will never forget her, and I will never forget that story. Those are the stories that you remember, the, 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 the human tragedies and just meeting people and seeing people go through things. Nancy mentioned Donovan Decker. Here's a guy that you know, is facing this, this horrible disease that, will, that, that could kill him someday. That's, right now it's putting him into a wheelchair, and yet he's, he's fighting for other people to find a cure. One of the uh, stories that touched me the most that was one of the first stories I ever did. I, when I moved to Nebraska, the night before I got there, a tornado came through and literally wiped out an entire town, oh, wow. leveled every house. And we're out there with cameras, and you have to decide, okay, am I here to, to record history, or am I here to be a human being? And you see a little old lady who's over picking up a, you know, a two-by-four that's, that's pinned down her granddaughter's doll, and you think, gosh, that's a great shot. That's going to be a huge impact on my story, but maybe I should go help her pick it up. You know, it's stuff like that that really touches mm -hmm. you. And that's the, the, the best part about our job is meeting people like that who you might not ever hear their stories or meet them face to face. And it's stories like that. I mean, there's, there's, there's hundreds of stories over the years mm -hmm. that, I could, that I could think of. That, uh, but that's the main thing. It's just where, where you can meet somebody and connect with somebody. Those are always the best stories. Mm -hmm. And those are the ones people remember. Mm -hmm. Everybody's got a story to tell. Who has it harder in the business, getting in and staying in, men or women? That's a tough one. That is a tough one. Uh, I think the nation is going through a trend right now, and it seems like more women are getting into the business because more men want to be in sports, mm -hmm. but there's not as many sports positions, so women are also getting some of those jobs. I, I don't. I don't really know. It's a. It, it's a. It's a real tough question because you've you've seen a lot of things introduced into our business in the last few years. Where, uh, like Nancy said, you know, there's more women on network news and and local news. And it used to be that uh, uh, men age gracefully and get character, and they're on forever. And women, it we're seemed, were, were <laughs> if they got to you know past 25 years old, they were washed up. You don't see as much of that anymore. Um, that, that's changed a lot. Uh, the role of, of minorities in our business has changed an awful lot. That uh, you know you can live in your city, and, and you should be able to turn on the TV and see your news team represent the different races of the people that are watching at home. That's been a big change. So it's. It, it's really tough to say. You go through stages where the, the, the uh, white middle-aged male was a dinosaur on TV. It, that was what everybody said. Well, you've got no future. You, know, you should go to sports and stuff like that. And you know, now it seems like that's, that's not as bad. So mm -hmm. I, think, I, think it's kind of, it, it really, I think there's a lot of equality in television right now on the news. I do, too. When you're out shooting a story or you're, out, um, you're, you're on the news desk reading a, <clears throat> a specific story, what is going through your mind if it's like something tragic? You know, like Mitch, you were talking about uh, the tornado wiping out the town, or, or uh, the, um, your story. You were talking about Nancy. What, you know, how do you deal with that, and how do you make sure that, you sh you know, you you have to show. There's no way you can't show any emotion, but how do you make sure you don't show too much and just you know lose it on camera? I pinch my fingers. Really? I I uh, I, I have terrible hands because I pick at them to try and and not, you know get too emotional because I'm very emotional, very. So I, I have no skin on the sides of my <laughs> thumbs. I don't. And, and last night when Mitch was showing his story, I was doing that. I was, you, you try to, 
you try not to think too much about that because I don't want to start crying on the air. But you also, you, you do, you feel everything that they're saying. And I, I try to put myself in their spot, although you never can. Just think, you know, what are they thinking about? How, how is their family dealing with this? And it's hard. It's hard sometimes to not break down. We had a great story last week on uh, a guy in Sioux Falls, Ray, how do you say his last name? Mitch? Kordick. Kordick, mm -hmm. who has leukemia. And it was just a heart-wrenching story about this family, how they need more people to donate bone marrow. And you know of them. And uh, it was, for me, I mean, we didn't really talk. We just listened to the piece, and it was quiet in the studio. And it's just to, to hear the families struggle with this. It's really hard not to show emotion. And, you, and you, you're right, Avi. You don't want to go over the top and completely break down. But on the other hand, you don't want to come out and say, well, it wasn't that great. We'll see you back here after the commercial and act mm -hmm. like you don't care. But mm -hmm. sometimes you're trying so hard not to show the emotion that you can come across as being cold. And that's, you know, that's just that's something everybody has to deal with. Mm -hmm. But yeah, you see stories like that. And uh, we've had a couple of stories the last couple of nights about these toddlers walking off in the middle of the night and, and getting hypothermia and almost dying. And you, know, you want to come out and say, parents, what are you thinking? Yeah. Why, how do you let your child walk off like this? But that's editorializing, and that's letting your own opinions and feelings come out too much. So you, you, gotta, you really have to walk a fine line with that kind of stuff, and it's hard. Yeah, these weren't any parents in South Dakota. They no. were national stories. But right. Mm -hmm. And see, and that really makes me want to say it because, you know, none of them are watching. But you do, like, hello? Mm -hmm. You just let your, the one, one of the dad, the dad was sleeping last night or whatever, and the child just wandered off into the cold. We do. We both do a lot of uh, <coughs> Special Olympics and uh, muscular dystrophy stuff, and both of those things are real emotional. Um, during the telethon, you're talking about a, you'll do a piece on somebody who is dying and somebody that you know very well. We don't just see these guys once a year. A lot of a lot of the, the kids and the adults, we, we see you know three four times a year and spend a lot of time and get to know them. And when you lose somebody like that, you That's can't right. help it but show the emotion. And you know I. I think I broke down and cried a couple of times on telethon. You have too, and it's just sometimes you just can't help it. Yeah. But you have to be a real person too. I think mm -hmm. that you know we're we're not just plastic robots that sit there and read the news. We care about stuff too. Mm -hmm. Speaking of being real people, and this happens quite a lot. What's been one of your more embarrassing moments on camera? Oh, there's just been so many. <laughs> Seriously, I, because it is live, and because. We are who we are, and you know when we're sitting there, we're, you know, we're not, you know, Mr. and Ms. Proper all the time. I, I do have embarrassing moments just about every day, but I've learned just to not be embarrassed about it. One of serious, I was just telling Mitch about this. One of the most seriously embarrassing things that happened to me was when I was a cheerleader at USD. We had a, we had this camp that we were teaching high schoolers, and I was quite tired in college. You don't get a lot of sleep, and I was trying to get on this podium. I had to warm up the crowd to, to do some aerobics. And I went to jump on this platform that was all wooden, and it was quite high, and I fell down. And oh. I had a bruise this big on my thigh. Ow. That was the most embarrassing. And you st I still had to get up, and, and I had sort of tears streaming down my eyes, trying not to cry because it hurt so bad. But this thing was the size of the moon. That's, but, you know, that's really embarrassing, but I have embarrassing moments every day. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, I, I get that question all the time, and I, I just know. I think back to you know the times when we were on the morning show together, um, when Nancy, whether she was trying to embarrass me or not, I don't know. We, we have all kinds of things. We'd be sitting there, and my philosophy is that I I don't think people at home really give a hoot about what we do on the weekends or what we do in our real lives and See, stuff I like, like that. See, I like to share that kind of stuff. And I would have this was before I was married, so if my wife's watching. Um, <laughs> I would, I, I would come back and Nancy would know I'd have a date or something over the weekend. And we'd come out on camera and, and I learned later, not to mention anything during the commercial break that I didn't want on the air. Because we'd come out of commercial and she'd say, you had a date this weekend, how'd that go? And I'm just going, Shut I know, he would, get, he would get mad at me sometimes. You know, that's, I'm sure, you know, we have, the embarrassing thing is we have to wear makeup. I hate wearing makeup. And luckily I had makeup on that day because I'm sure I was about four shades of red. We, we, stuff like that. Yeah. You learning to put the makeup on was, was funny. <laughs> First time you might have looked a little clownish with the rouge. Well, I did. I, I had uh, one time a, a make a, a embarrassing makeup story. I had a, a brand new suit on. I pressed white shirt and everything, and I and I was putting my makeup on, and I just did a fumble like that, and went, and it stuck. Oh. Sorry about the microphone. Stuck right here. And luckily, I came out and had this big brown spot where the, where oh. the makeup was, and I, I pulled my jacket over so you couldn't see it. And I'm thinking I'm I'm good to go. 
and we come out there first thing out of her mouth. Mitch has got a new suit and shirt on today. You know what he did? He put makeup all <laughs> over it. So. I'm the mouth himself. I, yeah. Eric Thorson's and really is the biggest mouth, but I'm I'm right up there. But it's that kind of stuff that you know that that's why I, I love working with her because you know we've got that you know kind of click going where we can I, I know what she's going to say before she says it. He and does. We can play off that and and we can just look at each other and Nancy will finish my sentence. You know so we're like an old married couple. Yeah, except not really because he has a very pretty <laughs> wife. <laughs> um, you know, you two obviously enjoy uh, working together. What's going to happen in the future if one of you decides, you know, you want to move on to a bigger market or, you know, you want to go somewhere else? I'm telling, me, I'm telling you right now, if you leave me again, that's it. We're divorced <laughs> for good. <laughs> there will be no reunion. And it, I don't know. It could happen. It could happen. I don't see it happening right now because, you know, we both love being here. And I, I think, I, you know, I don't want to speak too much for Nancy, but we both love doing our jobs. and. And, you know, last year we saw a guy at one of our competitors retire after being on the air for almost 30 years. And you, part of you says, boy, I, I could sure see myself doing that, you know, staying in one spot. There's a lot of people who like to market jump, that their goal is to get to Minneapolis, Denver, Chicago, wherever, the big mar the big time. But, you know, the big mm -hmm. time is big stress. It is. And Working it's, seven it's, days a week. You know, you don't, have, you don't really have a life. And when you find a community that you like and have a lifestyle that you like, why would you want to leave it? You know, I've, I, I've, I said this when I, when I got the job here. I've got the greatest job in, in, you know, in the world. And I, and I still think that. And I could see sitting next to her for another 20 years. Easy. Yeah, let's have a little hug. <laughs> Where do you two see uh, local television, local television news headed? Uh, is it going to keep the same route? Is it going to go, you know, is it going to take the high road? Or is it possible that it will take the low road? It terrifies me about the whole Internet thing. One, I don't particularly care for it, and mm -hmm. I think news is going that direction. You should talk more about that. You know stuff. Well, I... The internet is the big thing. I mean, I'm, I'm assuming you mean high road and low road being just the kind of well, stories we quality, we cover. quality, yeah, quality. Rock I think local TV is always going to have the quality because we have to. I mean, mm -hmm. I think the standards have slipped a little bit over the last, you know, 25 years or so of what's considered news, what's taboo to say on the air, and how much you can throw in your own opinions on things. But I think we have to keep the higher road, otherwise people aren't going to watch. You know, people people are going to continue to watch local news, I believe, because they want to know what's going on in their community. You can get some of that from the internet, and I would imagine sometime in the next few years, you'll be able to, you know, hop on the web and and watch a newscast. So, some stations have it now. We're in the process of getting it, mm -hmm. um, where it's on demand, or some of them have. You can just watch it when it comes on. I think you're, you're probably going to see the uh, you know television, computer, everything all in one unit. I mean, there's some of them out there right now where you can <laughs> buy that, but it's the information age and it's the instant information age. People don't have to sit around and wait till six o'clock in the evening to find out what's going on. It's too bad. I like the old days. Yeah, <laughs> I do. <laughs> but I think the other part of it is you know there's there's a certain amount of, of of loyal viewers who are in that habit of either putting us on you know, after they eat dinner or before they eat dinner or, or when they go to bed mm -hmm. to see what's going on and get caught up in the community and to see what's going on. Mm -hmm. Mitch, Nancy, thank you so much for being here today. You bet. I enjoyed talking with you. And I, and I thank you for watching us today. I'm Avi Forstein, and I hope you tune in for our next edition of Face to Face. From all of us here at OWL TV, good night. <laughs>